Hugo Eichner and his Zeppelin crew had been given a New York City hero's welcome when they delivered LZ-126 to America in 1924. The hangars in the cash box in Friedrichshafen were empty following delivery of the ZR-3. An appeal was addressed to the German people to contribute to the Zeppelin Eckner cause for the construction of a new commercial airship. The German people, slowly recovering from the devastating World War and its crippling Treaty of Versailles, responded to the Locarno agreements and Dr. Eckner's pleas with donations, allowing design and construction of a new airship. Chief designer Ludwig Duer positioned the bridge and cabin module far forward on the bow to reduce the airship's overall diameter. The number LZ-127 indicates the airship project number released for construction. In constructing this airship, approximately 66,000 feet of aluminum alloy girders connected by more than 5 million rivets were used. 127's master design stroke was his unique motivational fuel, a gaseous mixture named after its inventor. Carried in canvas sacks below the hydrogen lift cells, blau gas was blended to be about the same weight as air. 127's small number of heavy petroleum tanks put much less strain on the keel, and gasoline 6 pounds per gallon could be used for trim before consumption. Bracing of the structure required 420,000 feet of steel wire. The ship is equipped with five Maybach airship engines with a total power output of 2,630 horsepower. Top speed, 72 knots. To cover the rigid frame, 66,000 square yards of cloth were needed. Time of construction, 13 months. Length, 770 feet, a length that equals that of a freight train of about 20 cars or the longest dimension of a stadium sports field. Total weight of the ship, approximately 270,000 pounds or 135 tons. The necessary lift was provided by approximately 3,600,000 cubic feet of hydrogen. Expanding the 126 habitation module allowed spaces for two washrooms and 10 two-bunk passenger cabins accessible from a centerline passageway. At center was the dining room, featuring the largest opening windows. An all-electric galley occupied the starboard corner opposite the radio room. Forward of the navigation compartment was the command bridge, occupying the full width of the car's prow. For the first time in history, consuming fuel would not make the Zeppelin become lighter. 1928, Countess Hella von Brandenstein Zeppelin, daughter of the old Count, christened the LZ-127 with the name of her father, Graf Zeppelin. Dr. Eckener schrieb in seinem Lebensbericht, ich habe immer das Gefühl gehabt, dass die Wirkungen, welche vom Zeppelin-Luftschiff ausgingen, Dr. Eckener's initial test flights, that fall, were capped with a 34-hour endurance test around Germany, Holland, coastal England, and the North Sea. The weather finally cleared to encourage overflying the nation's capital. Graf Zeppelin über Berlin. The 1900-mile trip allowed thousands to see the fruits of their contributions. The acclaim and the enthusiasm of the Berlin people appear to be without limits. About to be ready to tackle the Atlantic with paying passengers, the Graf set off in October with Hearst News reporters Lady Hay Drummond Hay and Carl von Wiegand. Lady Drummond Hay and Herr von Wiegand from the American Press. High priority cargo was also carried. Lieutenant Commander Charles Rosendahl was the American Navy liaison. A typical North Atlantic storm tore off much of the lower fabric from the port horizontal fin. It was only the third Atlantic crossing against the prevailing winds in history. Billy Speck in der Funkzentrale setzt 27.000 Worte auf dieser Reise ab und nimmt 20.000 Worte auf. The drama of the damaged ship fighting the North Atlantic kept Americans rushing to their newsstands and glued to their radios. The crew performed in-flight mitigations before safely mooring at the U.S. Navy's airship base near Lakehurst, New Jersey. Heavier linen replaced the failed cotton by American teams already versed in fabric repair and doping. 
The converted fireman's ladders that had helped build the ZR-1 and service the ZR-3 were employed to replace the damaged covering. Some 20,000 people came to see the airship every day during her layover. In a rough time of about 50 hours from coast to coast, but I am convinced under all weather conditions, we will be able to make the flight in all regularity and safety. Thank you. Ekener and crew were again showered with accolades. Zeppelin fever continued across the states, with some wondering why America could not have its own transatlantic dirigible. With the nearly weightless fuel recognized as the future for airship practicality, a fuel gas facility was installed at NAS Lakehurst. Gassed up for the return trip, the Graf Zeppelin sold his first ticket for a female passenger, socialite Clara Adams. More high-priority cargo was carried back to Europe, as well as more than 100,000 pieces of profitable mail. More paying passengers and three U.S. Navy liaison officers, including famed balloonist Tex Settle, also went aboard. Once aloft, stowaway Clarence Terhune appeared, and he was quickly put to work washing dishes. Stewards Heinrich Kubis and Ernst Fischbach were challenged keeping all in order as the weather pitched and rolled the airship violently. First Officer Ernst Lehmann later wrote it was the worst night an airship ever survived. After 71 hours of rough weather, Graf docked in Friedrichshafen to a hero's welcome. Hugo Eichner was received by President von Hindenburg, and the crew was given a triumphant parade in Berlin. Reichspräsident von Hindenburg empfängt die Besatzung. Graf Zeppelin was overhauled during the winter. In March of 1929, the airship undertook a Mediterranean cruise, with passengers and German officials to demonstrate the airship could travel long distances, without support facilities. Zunächst nach Rom. LZ-127 zieht über den Petersdom, über den Platz von St. Peter, die Engelsburg und den Tiber. Küste hinüber nach Spanien. Über Sevilla brütet eine südländische Hitze. In Seville, a southern heat wave is encountered. Flying over large cities in several countries, the Graf continued to the Middle East. He descended almost a thousand feet below ocean level, at the dead, sea, diving deeper than submarines of the Great War. Attitudes in Berlin were beginning to soften by the time the Graf had returned and was once again loaded with passengers and mail, bound for America. The stormy weather in May, dictated a southern route over France. Once permissions were finally secured on May 16, the Graf Zeppelin headed for Spain. Suddenly one engine failed. Any hope of continuing the trip was given up when his second engine quit, and Graf was turned back against the wind. The fault was found to be an improper modification made to four engines. A third engine stopped, and when the fourth also gave out, little progress was being made into the headwinds. Hoping for a survivable forced landing in the valley below, the French unexpectedly offered to receive the crippled airship at a Riviera military base. Frenchmen grasped the Zeppelin and docked her in a reassembled German hangar that had been awarded to France after the Great War. Former rivals joined forces to install new engines, shipped in during the airship's two-month layover. Dodging disaster over France and the successful Mediterranean trip had set the stage for Hugo Eckener's most ambitious plan to publicize the airship's long-range transportation role. He proposed a trip all the way around the world. Eckener raised half the required funds from newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst, whose media empire would get rights to the story. Eckener worked up the rest by selling rights to German papers, as well as philatelic items, and two actual fares. Air postcards with the signatures of the 20 passengers were sold to contribute towards the cost. Many histories mention the world flight, but fail to emphasize the airship was not based where Hearst insisted the flight begin and end. 
So, in addition to circumnavigating the globe, the Graf Zeppelin would also have to complete two additional transatlantic trips before any in-depth overhaul could be performed. To meet Hearst's requirement, the Graf Zeppelin left Friedrichshafen on August 1st, with paying passengers and cargo, including Susie the Eighth and 600 canaries. The airship crew quickly discovered another stowaway, who was kept isolated to deny any publicity to his stunt. Entering one of the five engine gondolas during flight. The airship's New York arrival was again greeted with whistles, sirens and auto horns as 5,000 people jammed Battery Place. Only three airships had ever crossed the Atlantic. The Graf Zeppelin had accomplished that feat three times, himself, by touching down at Lakehurst. 127 was again docked next to her sister 126, to the delight of more than 100,000 spectators brought in by special trains. For American audiences, Dr. Eckener spoke about the plan to circumnavigate the entire globe. The flight of the Graf Zeppelin around the world, which we are about to start, will be the fulfillment of our hopes regarding the airship. We have flown the Graf Zeppelin three times across the Atlantic on other trips without any mishap either to passengers or crew. They have convinced me that the airship has passed the experimental stage and that the dirigible is a safe medium for long distances air trips. I do not regard the word flight as an adventure, but rather as an aerial voyage which will be successfully completed by our landing here back at Lakers early in September. The ship and crew are ready. In a little while we will be off in the air on the first trip around the globe by air. Auf Wiedersehen. Cameramen would be cranking out a great deal of motion picture film during the world trip. Sound was recorded during interviews, but the rest had to be dubbed later. Several edits would screen in the United States, Germany, and worldwide. In this program, we attempt to put together the best of several sources for a more complete history of this unique and incredible adventure. Lieutenant Commander Charles Rosendahl joined Liaison Officer Jack Richardson aboard Graf for training. Among the passengers are Germans, Americans, Japanese, one Australian, one Russian, one Frenchman, one Spaniard, one Swiss, and as the only woman on board, Lady Drummond Hay, representing the British press. Adequately stocked with provisions slated for preparation in the Spartan Electric Kitchen by Chef Otto Mans, suppliers cashed in on the notoriety, supplying the adventurers. Rosendahl later wrote he was surprised they didn't all come down with gout. Rosendahl explained the actual launch on the night of August 7 took advantage of favorable weather. We left New York at night. It's blinking lights giving us a fond farewell, and it was the first big thrill of the trip. The actual time from the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor to Land's End, England, was but 42 hours and 40 minutes. Upon leaving New York, the course was shaped directly to the east. Newsreel cameramen joined the two Hearst reporters remaining aboard, Lady Hay bringing along her terrier puppy she'd named, Happy.
As it had on all previous trips, the cruise rotation on bridge, lower keel, topside and engine car watches went on seamlessly in the background. The daily routine for stewards to reconfigure cabins from night to day and back again worked around passenger schedules. White tablecloths and fine china dinnerware replace typewriters at mealtime. Kapitän Lehmann. Hugo Eichner had at first objected to paying passenger William Leeds's insisting on keeping his phonograph and records, but they would prove popular during the long trip ahead. Recrossing the Atlantic with following winds even allowed a birthday party to be thrown for Dr. Eichner before lands, and England was overflown on the 10th. Docking at Friedrichshafen to replenish, some spark plugs were replaced, but the airship was found to be in excellent condition. Graf was again stocked up, and, loaded with 880 pounds of mail, departed for the next leg, early on the 15th. Over Germany, first in the direction of Berlin. Friedrichshafen receding into the distance, and beautiful Germany, the land whose genius made this epical event possible, unfolding before us. This is probably the most peaceful part of our voyage. An unending succession of busy cities and well-filled fields supporting millions of hard-working folk bearing the inevitable burden of war with fortitude and courage. This is home sweet home to most of those aboard. Max Pruss is the postmaster on board and has a lot of work. Again paying respect to Berlin's cheering crowds, the Graf headed northeast over the Baltic, Latvia, Estonia, and crossed into the Soviet Union. The Russian representative, Professor Karklin, insisted the airship overfly Moscow, but the weather report convinced Ekener to remain well north of the city. Moscovites were so insulted, the Graf had to suit their hurt feelings by paying a separate visit to the Russian capital later, in 1930. After a time, the airship crossed the famed Volga River, passengers not spotting a single boatman. Reaching Volga early the next morning, passengers noted more than 40 church spires, which Comrade Karklin said had been repurposed as schools. Turning due east, the Graf headed for the lowest elevation in the Urals, crossing that range at 3,000 feet. Entering largely uncharted territory, there was little evidence of human habitation as rivers were the only reference points for navigation in the endless swamps. Frightening the inhabitants of the tiny village of Berk and Batsko, the airship pioneers hoped to be the first to overfly the Tunguska site. There, 21 years earlier, a meteorite had exploded in the greatest natural catastrophe in recorded history. Comrade Karklin did not know the site's exact location. The radio was silent. Later research showed the airship had been too far north to take advantage of a unique scientific opportunity, which would never be repeated. Travel over the endless Siberian primal woodlands was punctuated by massive forest fires and a weather front.
Graf Zeppelin crosses Russia and Siberia, which are still full of mysteries and unexplored distances. Mountain ranges not recorded on maps are crossed. Breakfast on the third morning was already taken over Asiatic Russia, over the vast swamps and forests of the Siberian taiga. And what a contrast between the almost uncanny loneliness outside and the warm, sociable atmosphere on board. In the early morning of the fourth day, houses are sighted again at last. The first town for a long time, Yakutsk on the River Lena. A wreath was dropped where many German prisoners had been lost during the Great War. Ahead lay the largely unknown elevations of the Stanovoy's range, which proved to offer only a narrow passage once the airship had ascended to 5,500 feet, itself swelling to full capacity. Safely over the mountains, the Graf flew on to the Sea of Okhotsk. The ship crosses the Sea of Japan and the Japanese islands for a landing near Tokyo. Sped along by a tailwind, the Graf Zeppelin was by August 19th circling over Tokyo's loud welcoming shouts. A quarter of a million people witnessed the landing at the main Japanese airship base at Kasumigara. Townies and country people, dignitaries, members of the German community, soldiers, mothers with their children, and geishas. They all want to see the ship that has come down from the sky. Graf was docked in yet another former German hangar, awarded to Japan after the Great War. With the enthusiastic bonsai cheers of Japanese scouts, Japanese newspapers reported in detail on the receptions and ceremonies during the stopover, which lasted for several days. Following official greetings, the passengers and crew were driven to hotels for lavish meals amid being showered with gifts. Back at the hangar, loud gas was transferred from its expensive shipment of steel bottles, with local hydrogen refreshing the cells. On docking to leave in the early hours of the 22nd, handling gear jammed, and the lower engine car's struts were bent. Embarrassed Japanese vowed to commit suicidal atonement if the ship could not continue, but the crew assured the men the damage was reparable. Indeed it was, and the ship got underway the next day, as Professor Karklin returned to Russia. Carrier pigeons carried newspapermen's reports back to Japan for the first day. For the unexplored skies of the Pacific, on the first non-stop flight ever made across that boundless ocean. The open Pacific challenged the crew's navigation skills with fog and rain. Ekiner had sought out the typhoon that had delayed the ship in Japan. Now the storm was pushing them along at almost 100 miles an hour. Lady Hay takes the helm for a few moments as we pass over our first and only steamer of the Pacific voyage. Eventually the passengers, especially Lady Hay, were permitted to take turns around the ship's duties. Crossing the international dateline was the single meridian where the ship's clock did not have to be reset. They had regained the full day they had been losing an hour at a time.
Every member of the crew on the alert as the American coast draws near. The coast of America is sighted 68 hours after leaving Japan. When the vast Pacific was finally conquered, there was cause for celebration. By the afternoon of Sunday, August 25th, San Francisco was in sight. Open up that golden gate, California, here I come. The Graf Zeppelin had completed the first air crossing of the Pacific to the welcoming horns and sirens of the city by the bay. then loafed down the coast, slowing by Hearst's castle at San Simeon, which erupted in light. Arriving at Los Angeles at 2 a.m., they waited until sunrise to begin the landing. Though remaining in nearly the same static condition as when leaving Japan, the Graf had to vent hydrogen into the air to descend through a temperature inversion. U.S. Navy sailors, assembled as a ground crew, walked the visitor to mooring. Even the local Goodyear blimp helped welcome the travelers. The mast brought up from San Diego for use at Mines Field was too tall, so an accommodation ladder had to be constructed by guesswork, then constantly realigned as the airship weather vaned in the wind. Hugo Eckener and guests were whisked away for more welcoming ceremonies, and a banquet hosted by sponsor William Randolph Hearst. The Navy crew set about piping aboard the blow gas from a rail car and lifting gas from bottles. Once filled, it appears the August California Sun's expansion open cells pressure safety valves, enough to lose a significant amount of the hydrogen to the surrounding air. Later, replacement gas trucks simply could not reach the field owing to the massive traffic jam. Some crewmen were disembarked, and a great deal of stores, ballast, and even fuel were unloaded, but only a dynamic takeoff was possible. Captain von Schiller reports on the takeoff after a day's stay in Los Angeles. Dr. Ickener always kept cool, was always in control of the situation. When we were in Los Angeles on our trip round the world, we were supplied with too little gas due to some mistake. This meant that we didn't have enough lift, so we discarded everything that wasn't essential. We even left part of the crew behind. The ship rose to about 65 feet, but then we got into an inversion, a change in the temperature gradient. The air got warmer, and the ship wouldn't rise any further. Some distance ahead, still a few kilometers away, we could see a high tension line which was a bit higher than our 65 feet. Ekener jettisoned the last water reserves in the ship. Then he called for full speed. Kurt Ekener, his son, was at the elevator controls, and Ekener said to him, keep her steady, absolutely horizontal. We were heading towards these high tension wires, and shortly before we reached them, Ekener took another look at the speedometer and then told his son to take her up. The bows of the ship rose slowly, and the high tension line was about 20 or 40 feet below us. The wires, as thick as your arm, slid past below us, and one had the feeling, there goes the rear gondola. But then, Ekener said to me, now pull her down again, which I did, together with Kurt Ekener. We were suddenly horizontal again, and had gone over that high tension line like a horse over a jump. That was really an achievement, and we were all highly impressed. Das war wirklich eine Leistung, die allen von uns doch sehr imponiert. The bow cleared the lines, but the tail dug into the ground. Rosendahl would later recall it as the most harrowing experience of the trip. The fifth engine was spun up and the airship gradually punched through the temperature inversion which had caused so much hydrogen to be vented before landing. The rudder still responded to the steersman, its damage not easy to see. Heading south to find the lowest mountain elevations, Graf Zeppelin then crossed the American West, helped along by continued following winds. Dr. Ekener was convinced of the advantages of the airship. 
There is no finer way of traveling around the world than by airship. The flight is absolutely silent, with no pounding or bumping. In its smooth flight, the airship is like a silver fish in a blue sea of air, a kind of symbol. It's essentially a vehicle of peace, and this is its most important function. In his memoirs, Dr. Eckner said, I always had the impression that the emotional impact emanating from the Zeppelin airships was largely due to the people's aesthetic senses. The impressive mass of the huge airship's body, coupled with elegance and mobility and beauty of shape and a bright sandy coloring, brought about a deep impression of fascination and awe through the human senses. Of all the cacophonous welcoming noises in other worldwide cities, Chicago's was the loudest as the airship flew around the nation's second largest city with its many former German inhabitants. Whether having postponed the planned trip to Chicago back in 1928, all were grateful for the clear weather that gave Chicago ones a perfect view of the silver ship. Graf would visit Chicago again in future years. Crossing Detroit and Akron in the darkness, the Graf Zeppelin reached New York early on the morning of the 29th. And the next morning, New York itself. Once again, a chorus of ship sirens and other signals in greeting, just as in San Francisco. The round-the-world trip ends in keeping with Hearst's conditions over the Statue of Liberty after 21 days, including all the stopovers. Cruising over New York, the airship is greeted by the sirens of the ships in the harbor and the excited crowds that fill the streets to watch the airship. The Graf Zeppelin then lands at Lakehurst. The sponsored trip was completed with a lap around Lady Liberty before settling down to Lakehurst sailors. First man ashore was Navy officer John Richardson, who jumped off, straight into the arms of his wife. When the ship docked, the crowd nearly enveloped Dr. Eckener, the passengers, and crew. The crowd of 25,000 onlookers broke through the lines and mobbed the airship. Hardly anyone paid attention to the damaged rudder. However, the near disaster at Los Angeles would influence changes to be made to the American airships then in final design. Die ganze Stadt scheint elektrisiert zu sein. Sie ehrt Dr. Eckener und seine Mannschaft mit der berühmten Konfetti Parade. Excitement is at fever pitch in America as the ship lands in Lakehurst. The world trip by LZ-127 Graf Zeppelin is an international sensation. After the landing has been successfully carried out with the aid of a well-trained American ground crew, a triumphal reception is mounted for the Zeppelin travelers. New York is in ecstasy, determined to do justice to the great occasion. In yet another ticker tape New York reception, totaling the greatest number ever given any foreigners, Police Chief Grover Whalen escorted Dr. Eckener to a reception by Mayor Jimmy Walker. Motorcade through the city among the weaving masses of people is a triumphant confirmation of the airship idea. Later, the National Geographic Society would award Eckener with their gold medal. American postage stamps then featured the Graf Zeppelin, an honor never bestowed on American airships. President Hoover beglückwünscht Dr. Eckener in Washington. Herbert Hoover invited Eckener to the White House, also rare for a German national, where the president praised him as a modern Columbus and Magellan. Dr. Eckener, it gives me a great deal of satisfaction to personally congratulate you upon so noteworthy an attainment. Finally, the German crews turned to launch for home. 
Ernst Lehmann accepted Ship's command from Dr. Eckener, who remained behind to continue working the business side of worldwide airship navigation and commerce. As Graf Zeppelin made yet another Atlantic crossing, Eckener was conversing with Paul Litchfield of Goodyear Zeppelin. Joined by former Zeppelin designer Dr. Carl Arnstein, the party visited the construction of what was to be the largest airship dock yet built. All were aware the British were about to finish their giant, R-100, which would be beginning her test flights in a few months. They looked over plans for the big Navy airplane-carrying airships just contracted, discussing how passenger versions could be derived. Attending the Cleveland Air Races, Eckener met with investors and money men who seemed to agree that Graf Zeppelin's demonstration showed they might profit by building an airship fleet to carry passengers and cargo most anywhere in the world. Despite Graf Zeppelin's perfect performance and safety, it is regarded only as an intermediate step. Landing in Friedrichshafen on September 4th, the Graf Zeppelin's mission had flown 31,000 miles, much greater than the distance around the Earth's equator, without major maintenance. Landing starts just before 8 a.m. On the morning of the 4th of September 1929, just about 68 hours after leaving Lakehurst, LZ-127 Graf Zeppelin approached its home port at Friedrichshafen on Lake Constance which it had left on its journey round the world on the 15th of August, 20 days before. Cannon fire in salute. And then, rising above the sounds of rejoicing, came the strains of the Graf Zeppelin march, which was always played when a ship returned to base after a successful voyage. The waiting crowd, made up of sightseers, relatives of the crew, ground crew and officials, were all delighted and proud of the Zeppelin adventurers. The acclaim and jubilation which greet the Graf Zeppelin on its return to Friedrichshafen know no bounds. In 21 days, the airship circled the Earth, passed through all climactic zones and broke all flight records of the time. The future certainly seemed to be smiling on the prospects of a peaceful world connected by international commerce via speedy, rigid airships. The career of the Graf Zeppelin foreshadows the future of lighter-than-air aircraft. An Arctic exploration flight demonstrated the still unfulfilled promise of possibilities in the far north. On its way to becoming the most successful airship ever built, Graf Zeppelin would take many more goodwill trips around Europe. The Graf is no stranger to America. At various times and in various trips, she has crossed the skylines of many a big city. The American stock market crash, only a few weeks later, in October, triggered a worldwide depression, evaporating the resources that might have developed oceanic airship trade on the heels of the successful world flight. Truthfully, Graf was conceived and always seen as a prototype, test vehicle, to demonstrate airship capabilities. Graf would nonetheless go on to establish regular service between Spain and Brazil, with tickets and mail, providing much of the operational costs. Year in and year out, it has flown a regular transatlantic schedule, and these figures tell its story. Up to 1934, it flew 460,000 miles, carrying 8,900 passengers or 23,000 persons, including the crew. However, there would never again be anything like the world circumnavigation trip in which a small band of airship adventurers captured the world's attention.